Amen. Jesus, we worship you because you are our lion and our lamb. We need a lion today, Father. We need a lamb today to pay not only for the sins of the whole world, but for my sins, for our sins here today. Thank you that you are the lion and the lamb. Thank you that every knee will bow before you because you are worthy of our praise. You are the most glorious one. God, I pray that we would see you clearly today. I pray that nothing would get in the way of us seeing you clearly today. Father, we want to hear from you. We want to hear from your spirit. We want to hear from your word. We want to continue to worship you and see what you would have for us today. Not so that we can walk out in our own power, but so that we can walk with the lion and the lamb leading our way today. We ask your spirit to come into this place, to be here among us, and to do the work that you intend to do among us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Grace Community Church. My name is Jason, one of the pastors here at Grace. Specifically, I'm one of the pastors at our downtown Iowa City location. We meet Sunday nights, um, downtown Iowa City. I'm so glad to be here worshiping with you on Thanksgiving weekend. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, I was thinking about this last night. I wish that all of us, I wish we would have put out a memo, and I wish we would have all agreed before we came to church today just to wear sweatpants. I mean, all of you and me, we wish we were in sweatpants. If we would have just all agreed upon it, we could have all worn sweatpants. So kind of a missed opportunity there. But we hope that you've had a great time with friends and family over Thanksgiving. Uh, while at the same time, we acknowledge what Rodney acknowledged, that for some of you, um, the holidays are tough. And so we're so thankful we're, that you're here. We feel like you're in the right place, not because we have something to offer you, but because we serve a great God and we worship a great God. And that's what we're here to do today. If you're new here, or if you feel new here, we want to give you a special welcome, and we're thankful that you're here. Um, we just want to encourage you to meet someone after the service. Uh, just talk to the folks around you. Get to know someone. Um, it's a busy time of year. There's a lot going on with the holidays and everything, but as we leave the service today, let's keep in mind that the holiday experience is not the same for everyone. So let's be conscientious of that as we greet one another, as we talk to one another, and as we spend some time chatting after the service. So uh, we would encourage you to do that after the service today, just to get to know one another. We're continuing on in our series on the Reformation um, as we're looking at scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, and to the glory of God alone. We'll continue that series today. We've been in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 the last few weeks as we've been looking at that scripture and as we've been looking at the Protestant Reformation and the 500 year anniversary of that. We've been seeing some themes that run through it and I hope to kind of tie all that together today. So if you would grab your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Um, my podium is awkwardly over there so I'm going to go get it. You just talk amongst yourselves, uh, pull out your Bibles. Would love for you to follow along today in Ephesians 2. 8 through 10. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. So as we've been going through this series, we've seen a number of themes, as I said. I want to talk a little bit about why we're doing this series. The goal of this series is not to just learn a little nugget of history that's going to um, help us understand history better, or to know what the Protestant Reformation is, or just to celebrate a 500-year anniversary. It's not just to poke fun at uh, Catholics uh, back then or now. Um, the goal of this series is really for us to see some themes that brought about the Protestant Reformation. Uh, but we really feel like that as we dig into the scripture and as we talk about these subjects, uh, there are some key things that we as individuals and we as a church need to focus in on. Because some of the things that happened that brought about the Protestant Reformation, some of the ills in the church and the things that the reformers were reforming against or reforming about are things that aren't just 500-year-old problems. The problems that they were trying to reform actually happen in the hearts of men and women, just like you and me. So the focus of this series is that we would learn something for ourselves, for our church, that we would be more gospel-oriented in the things that we do. Um, as we are starting this series, my co-pastor downtown, Steve, he has a PhD in Reformation era history, so he knows a lot about this subject. And um, he, one of the things he said, I, I was asking him, how were these things going on in the Catholic Church, especially 500 years ago? And his answer was, when you put humans in charge of churches and institutions, 
bizarre things take place. And that is the truth. We see it not just 500 years ago, but we see it today as well. When humans are put in charge of institution, things go haywire, things get bizarre, things become about the individual person or the individual leader. And they cease to be about what they are supposed to be about. This church and any church is supposed to be about the glory of God. But if you're like me, far too often it becomes about us. Or it becomes about the church, the the brand or the name or something corporately that's going on. When really our lives and this church are to be about the glory of God. Because he is worthy of that glory as you will see this morning. And as we take a look at the Protestant Reformation, a couple of key figures in that were Martin Luther and John Calvin. And they, from the very beginning, were trying to bring reform from within the Catholic Church. That's why it's called the Reformation. They wanted to first reform the Catholic Church because that's what they knew of church. They both grew up in the Catholic Church and were serving the Catholic Church and saw things that needed to change. So they wanted to bring about a Reformation. And so one of the things that kind of symbolically kicked off the Reformation is Luther posting his 95 thesis on the door of the church. And one of those um, thesis was number 62, and it's applicable to what we're talking about here today. Luther wrote, the true treasure of the church is the most holy gospel of the glory and the grace of God. He was saying a church is only as good as it points to the glory of God through the good news of the gospel. And what he saw in his church and in the Catholic church worldwide was he saw that they were starting to see the treasure of the church being the church or the leaders in the church or the sacraments and the things that were to point to these things. And so Martin Luther was saying the true treasure of the church is what God has done, who God is, his glory and his work through Christ on our behalf. And then on his footsteps, we see John Calvin, who started a large church in Geneva. It was a large Protestant church, one of the first big Protestant non-Catholic churches a few years after Luther. And in his church, he wrote a catechism. If you're not familiar with the catechism, um, it's a question and response way of learning scripture and theology. Some of you are probably far too uh, aware of what a catechism is, but for some of us, like me, um, it's kind of a newer concept. But in Calvin's Geneva, this is the beginning of the catechism that he wrote for his Protestant church. Question number one, what is the chief end of man? Answer, to know God by whom men were created. Question number two, what reason have you for saying so? Answer, because he created us and placed us in this world to be glorified in us. And it is indeed right that our life, of which himself is the beginning, should be devoted to his glory. They were saying that everything should be about God, what he has done, because he is the most glorious, and what he has done for us so that we may be made right with God, so that we could share in his glory, so that we could be in relationship with this glorious and holy God. Martin and Luther are saying that, or Martin Luther and John Calvin are saying that that needs to be the treasure. That is the treasure. That's the treasure of scripture. It's the treasure of church. It's the treasure of our whole lives, what God has done for us. As Calvin started his church in Geneva, he took some very active steps to strip away some of the things that were distracting from the gospel being the treasure and were making it look like the church was the treasure. Very practical things. He really, as he started the church, he had two main focuses. One was teaching theology, that people would learn scripture for themselves scripture alone, that that would be the authority in their lives. So he wanted people to learn theology. And so he trained up men to teach the church theology. The second wing of the church was um, kind of the hospitality or the benevolent wing, where they would literally start hospitals out of the church, where they would have trained medical uh, people that would take care of people inside of the church building. So he stripped it down to teaching people to love God and then loving our neighbor as ourself. And he made that the focus. He took Jesus at his word that that sums up the law and the prophets, that we love God and we love our neighbor as ourself. He did some even more practical things in the way that they structured the actual sanctuary, 
the church house where the people would come to worship. The first picture up here is of St. Peter's Basilica. It's in Rome. It's a Catholic church that is very ornate with gold, uh, with paintings on the ceiling. It's a tourist attraction for people of many different faiths to come together and see this great place of worship. And this was, you know, it's one of the nicest, but this was kind of a prototype, and this is what some of the other Catholic sanctuaries looked like. There was a focus on icons. There was a focus on um, this being a, a place to go, a place to be, a place to uh, enter into the presence of God by how beautiful it looked. I can't find a picture of any of the churches where Calvin worshipped because they were so plain. They've probably fallen apart by now. But I did find one of the first churches in America. This is what it looks like. It was in Virginia. And this is very um, much like the churches that Calvin set up in Geneva and spreading out all over in Europe. Very plain. Stripped of all icons. Stripped of the gold. Very plain. Because he wanted the focus to be on scripture, on Christ, on faith, on the glory of God. One of the things that he would very pragmatically do, John Calvin, is as he would read scripture, the, the congregation would stand and they would listen to scripture, but he would turn his back and he would face the altar with the congregation to make the focus on scripture alone and not on the deliverer of the scripture. Our lives and this church are not to be about the glory of self, but the glory of of God. As I say that this morning, you may have one of two reactions. The first reaction may be, I don't like that. I don't like the idea that it's supposed to all be about God. Wait, what about me? What's in this for me? What it, what's, I thought I was supposed to have this personal relationship with God and I was going to benefit from that. What about me? I, I don't really like all this talk of the glory of God. Or you may be thinking, man, I just struggle to think that way. I know intellectually it's about the glory of God, but I just see my life being about all these other things. And I just forget. I get busy. I get tired. I get unfocused. I get distracted. I get caught up in my own sin and shame. Either way, wherever you find yourself this morning, we need scripture to do its work, to show us the truth about who God is. And as we do that, everything else will fall into place the way that it should be. Before we jump into Ephesians 2, I want to do a little bit of definitions here. When we talk about the glory of God, when we talk about God's glory, we see two different words as we read the New Testament. Um, one meaning God's glory, just as it is, who he is. Uh, the word glory means weightiness, gravity the amount of weight that something carries, something has. Think gravitational pull. Think the weightiest thing. As you put it into water, it displaces the water. And then you have this other word that means us seeing him as holy, us ascribing to him holiness, us looking at him and saying, that's glorious. So as we read the New Testament, these are the words we're saying. Sometimes it's talking about who God is in and of himself, and sometimes it's about us ascribing to him glory, us saying, that is glorious, that is best. So as we talk about the glory of God, we are talking about him being the best, the greatest, the one with the most weight, the one that's worthy of our praise. He is the true treasure. Nothing else can we compare to it. Nothing else stacks up to who he is and what he has done. So Ephesians 2 will be up on the screen, but if you want to take a look at it with me, and we'll talk about the different parts that I have underlined there on the screen. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. You see some themes here. We've been hitting on these themes each week during this Reformation uh, time as we've been talking about Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We've gone over this, I think it's seven weeks in a row. So this is somewhat review, but I'd like us to think about it all together as a package and say, what is Paul, the writer of this letter to the church in Ephesus, what is he saying? What is he trying to get across to them and to us today? 
So we read, it's by grace you have been saved through faith. It's by grace we have been saved. The question is, saved from what? We'll take a look at that in just a minute. We'll see what our natural state is apart from God. It'll be very clear as we take a look at the first three verses of Ephesians 2. We did a couple sermons on those. We're going to refresh those today. But it's very clear as we see a picture of Scripture that it's by grace that we're saved. There's nothing in and of ourselves that we bring to the table that God says, that's good, I want to save that. Or I want to save that person. It's by grace that you have been saved. And we get that through faith. It's how we receive it. It's through faith. It's believing in the one who says that it's true. It's believing in the one who has made a way for us to be made right with him. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. In case we miss the point, Paul is going to keep reiterating the same idea. And this is not your doing. It is the gift of God. It is not a result of works so that no one may boast. It's a gift. It's something that God has given us. I'm going to give my kids Christmas presents. Not because they've earned it, but because I love them. I want to model God's love for me. I want to model Christ coming as the greatest gift ever. I want to give them gifts to remind them of the giver, to remind them of the grace and the gift that God has given them. But they don't earn those presents. We earn a paycheck. We earn a paycheck. When you look on your pay stub, it says you've worked this amount of hours, you get paid this amount, and so here is what, well, I guess they take some taxes and stuff like that out of it, but whatever's left, you get it in your paycheck. You earned that. It's your reward for working. But that's not the way a gift works. A gift is given freely. A gift is given not based on merit. Gift is not given as a reward. Gift is, a gift is given out of grace. Because of the graciousness of the giver. Our salvation, our being made right with God is not a result of our works. So that no one can boast. We have nothing to boast in. When Jesus is in the room, we have nothing to boast in. Because he has done all the work. We don't bring anything to the table in our salvation. So there's nothing for us to boast in. We can't say, I was a good church kid, but God helped me. I just need a little boost into heaven. That's not the story. The story isn't, I finally figured out the gospel, and so Jesus saved me. Or I stopped doing all this bad stuff, and I did more good stuff. Or I started going to this great church. Or whatever your story is, you did not bring anything to the table for your salvation. So there's no boasting. So why do we do good works? We are his workmanship. Those good works were created in Christ Jesus. God prepared them in advance that we should walk in them. Then we do good works because God loves us. Because God loves us. Out of an overflow of our heart. See, what Luther was seeing is he felt like the Catholic Church in that time was making the sacraments the focus. The sacraments were the focus to be made right with God. He says, no, 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 no. Christ is the true treasure of the church, and we do any sacraments or anything else we do, it's in light of what Christ has already done. It's a good work that he has prepared in advance for us to do. Those sacraments are not how we receive grace. Those sacraments are an outflow of remembering grace. When we take communion here at Grace, we read in scripture, and Jesus tells us, take communion in remembrance of me. Not to earn my love, not to show that you're really sincere. He says, do this to remember what I've already done for you. And this is all the case. It's a gift. It's by grace through faith because of what we've already studied in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is our state before we come to Christ. This is who we are. Let's take a look. We're spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins. We know what we ought to do and we don't do it. We know what we shouldn't do, and we do it. We don't let God be the king. We try to be the king. We don't live up to society's standards, God's standards, or our own standard of conduct. 
following the course of this world. We're caught up going where everyone else is going, valuing the things that everyone else values, following the enemy, Satan. That's what it's talking about, the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that's now at work. He's talking about our enemy, the devil. And then he says, you're doing things according to the flesh, the passions of the flesh. You're carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. He's saying, this is what you brought to the table for your own salvation. You were dead. You were caught up in this world. You were given over to the enemy and your very flesh that you live in was against God. That's what you brought to the table. Paul is trying to give us a picture here of what it means to be saved. It's a gift. It's God breathing spiritual life into us that didn't exist in and of ourselves. And there's no way to attain it outside of his loving action towards us in Christ. There is just not enough sacraments we can do, not enough good things we can do, not enough cleaning up our act that we can do to earn God's love. Because he's perfect. He's not just a better version of your earthly father. And he's not just a better God than all the other gods. He is the perfect, holy, glorious, one true God that created everything. You bring nothing to that equation. Neither do I. In fact, Paul in the book of Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25, says to pray for the unbelievers that God may perhaps grant them repentance that leads to the knowledge of truth. The moment that we come to Christ and we put our faith in his work on our behalf to be made right with God is a miracle. If we are granted repentance, it is a miracle that God has done on our behalf. Sounds like a great deal, right? Sounds amazing. Sounds great. This good news, it's such good news. But wait, there's a glitch in the system, right? As you hear about this good news, or as you've heard about this good news in the past, something comes up in the back of our mind far too often. What comes up in the back of our mind is, this sounds too good to be true. What is the catch? There's got to be a catch. There's got to be a yeah, but. There's got to be a, a clause. There's got to be an asterisk. There's got to be a footnote. There's got to be something hidden in the contract that I'm not aware of. Because this sounds too good to be true. If you've never heard the good news and thought, that's scandalous. That's provocative. That's, I can't wrap my brain around that. That sounds too good to be true. I've never heard of anything like that. If you've never thought that, then you don't really understand that it's good news. Because it is such good news, it is like nothing else you've ever heard. And it's like nothing you could do. Human minds would never come up with grace. Because human minds are law-based. And as much of a good guy as you think you are, you are law-based. If you are a boss and you have an employee that does not show up a certain amount of days, you will and should fire them. And as much as you think you're in a gospel-centered marriage and you're in a great marriage and things are good, there is a limit to how much you would forgive your spouse. If they just kept going off and doing their own thing and being with other people and acting like they weren't married to you, there would be a limit to your grace and your forgiveness. The human mind is law-based. We run relationships, we run our workplaces, we run our societies based on law. So the idea of the good news of the gospel is directly against the reason in our mind. And it's directly against anything we've ever experienced in this world. So the glitch in the system is that this all sounds too good to be true. The way I put it here in the PowerPoint, it says, if grace is a gift, why do we insist on paying? Because that's what ends up happening. We say, okay, I got to do my part. I got to pay my end of the deal. God gave me a gift. It was a great gift. I'm me. I'm a mess. I got all these mistakes that I'm making, all this sin, all this brokenness, all this suffering that I'm bringing to the table. I better pay God back. We see his grace and his love towards us as a loan that now we need to pay back. 
over the course of our life. So we live that way for one of these three reasons. One, we don't know the truth. We just don't know. Maybe this is new information for you. Or maybe you grew up in a religious environment that talked about grace and talked about the gospel, but the law was a much louder word than grace. There are way too many churches that the law is louder than grace. There are way too many churches and way too many Christians that talk about the law more than the Bible does. That's a problem. Maybe you just don't know. Maybe you don't know this good news. Maybe you don't know about this grace that is so good. Number two, we forget the truth. This is me, moment by moment, struggling to remember the good news, struggling to remember it's not about my performance, struggling to remember that I didn't earn it to begin with, so I can't lose it. This is me. This is the apostle Peter. He walked with Jesus, but he is just a roller coaster of believing Jesus one moment and then denying him, betraying him, doubting him, not appropriating the gospel to the Gentiles, coming to faith. He's just a roller coaster. That's me. I think that's you too. We forget the good news and we start living by the law in our moment by moment days. I can teach this stuff. I can counsel people by it. I can write about it, but I struggle to do it. Or number three, we don't want the truth. We don't really want it to be about someone else. We want to bring something to the table. We want to pay off our salvation. We want to bring something to the table so God doesn't have anything on us. We want to treat God the way we treat every other relationship. The idea of a one-sided covenant or a one-sided salvation or one-sided gospel, it just It makes our skin crawl a little bit. It's a little bit too scary. Or we just flat out don't want it at all. We don't want to have anything to do with what I'm talking about here today. Giving glory to another is something that does not sit well with us. So for any one of these reasons and probably more, we have rewritten Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, as I've done up here on the screen. I'd like you to make a note in your notes and on the DVD, maybe we can make the note of this before it goes out, that this is written by me and not in scripture. Just to be clear, I don't want to end up on some YouTube channel about heretics or something, but I've rewritten this and I didn't have to do extensive research for this. I didn't read this in a book. I didn't have to sit there and pray through this. I didn't have to think about this over the course of weeks. I just thought about my day. I thought about who I am when I'm walking in the flesh. I thought about what makes the most sense in my mind. This is how we've rewritten Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 with how we live our lives. For by merit, you have been saved through effort. And this is your doing. It is the reward for your purity. It hasn't been given to you. Now go on and boast. For we are making ourselves better created by God to do good things, which God asked us to do, now we better do them. You're laughing because you know. This is far too often how we live our lives. Do you know what this life looks like? Shame. Anxiety. Fear. Anger spiritual dryness, not sharing the good news, because it's not good news. This is a rat race. You know why it's called a rat race? Because rats and mice and hamsters, they are in a cage, they're running and they're getting nowhere. You ever feel like that spiritually? I do. Like you're running, 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 getting nowhere. If this is how we live our lives, and if we think this is how the gospel works, 
It's no longer good news and you're going to be a mess. Because you're going to keep thinking you have to pay God back and you're going to realize day in and day out you can't. So you're going to think that you're in a covenant with a holy God that you can't keep up your end of the deal. You're either going to be exhausted or stop. You're just going to quit. If this is the case, your salvation is up to you. When you are tempted, it's up to you. When you are anxious, it's up to you. When you fear, it is up to you. Raising your kids, you're on your own. Fixing your marriage, completely up to you. Figuring life out, entirely up to you. But the beauty of the gospel is that this is not what Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says. The Bible tells us it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing, but the gift of God so that no one may boast. The fact that you have nothing to boast in and the fact that it's not all about you and it's about God's glory is good news. If it's about you, it's bad news. If it's about me, it's bad news. I don't bring enough to the table to lead my family. I don't bring enough to the table to raise my kids. I don't bring enough to the table to be a pastor or to teach this stuff on Sundays. I don't bring enough to the table. It's bad news if it's about me. It's good news if it's about him. Colossians chapter 3, verses 2 through 3. This is speaking of the believer. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You are hidden in Christ. He is the one receiving the glory because he is the one that received the punishment, the consequences, the wrath that you deserved for your sin. Because God is perfect, he's glorious, and he can have nothing to do with sin. He displaces sin because of his holiness, his righteous perfection, his glory. It displaces us. But you know who is welcomed in? Christ. We are in Christ. Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, we went through it for like 100 weeks or something. It was in Christ, in Christ, 11 times. In Christ is what we read. In Christ. We are hidden in Christ. The righteous perfection of Christ, God's only Son, His righteous perfection is what gives us the merit to come close to the Father. It is nothing you have done. Nothing. Nothing you will ever do can earn you that privilege. It is only the righteous perfection of his son. And on the cross, he took our sin and he gave us his righteousness, that we may be called children of God. Romans chapter 6, verse 4, Paul puts it this way. When Christ was buried, you were buried with him. When he rose from the dead, you came to life, and now you can walk in newness of life. Being hidden in Christ and God getting all the glory is good news. He deserves it. He has earned it through what he has done for us, and there's no better way to live. Constantly trying to earn his favor, constantly trying to do good works is a no-win game. We need to stop playing. We need to stop playing and realize that if we are in Christ, the work is done. On the cross, he said, it is finished. He was talking to you. He was telling you, it's finished. He was telling you, stop striving to earn my love. This is what love looks like. This is what it looks like, me dying for you. It's finished. Please rest in that today. Rest in that today. Because even as you hear these words, there's something in the back of your mind that says, I'm going to blow it. I'm going to forget it. I'm going to walk out of here and my kids are going to yell at each other in the van and then I'm going to yell at them and we're going to be late to lunch and it's just going to all go down the tube. You're right, it will. It will. That's okay. Your standing before God is not with your awesome parenting. It's good news. When we live like we are hidden in Christ... God gets the glory. Then we're living for the glory of God through scripture. The glory of God through faith. The glory of God through his grace. The glory of God through Christ. 
All of these things that we've talked about, about the last five weeks, they tie together to show us that there is one that is glorious. And the true treasure of your life and this church is him and what he has done. So our highest authority is scripture. The way we receive grace, by faith. We receive grace as a gift, and it's because of what Christ has done for us. And who gets the glory for that story? It's him. The one that is glorious. He gets the glory for this story. It's the story of the Bible. It's the story of our lives. And it's time that we live more in this story instead of trying to write a choose your own adventure. My life is just a mess when I choose my own adventure. When I try to take the glory, when I try to be the good news, when I try to do all the right things, when I try to show God how worthy I am of the gospel, that's when my life is an adventure that I don't want to go on. But when he is seen as glorious, it's good news for us and for others. It's been all over the book of Ephesians already, and we'll just keep seeing it. So the praise of his glory, Christ unites all things in him. We were the first to hope in Christ that we may praise his glory. We've been given the spirit as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance to the praise of his glory. We've received riches of the glorious inheritance of the saints. We are united with Christ, and we have been given all that he has been given. And we've been given the immeasurable riches of the grace and kindness towards us in Christ. The Father has poured out his riches, poured out his mercy, poured out his love through what Christ has done for us. And that's really good news. When I was 10 years old, I got a Nintendo for Christmas. Got a Nintendo for Christmas, the first Nintendo. My parents couldn't afford it. I don't know how they got it, but I was expecting something small and I opened up a Nintendo. I told everybody, I told everybody. All of a sudden, I was that kid that other kids wanted to come over and play Mario Brothers at my house. It was good news. I told everybody. It was a gift. It was a gift. We have much greater news than that. But we're only going to see it as good news if we understand it's been given and we can receive it freely today. Would you stand up with me? The band is going to come up and we're going to sing one last song about the one who is worthy of our praise. You may find yourself in one of two different boats here this morning. One, you may know this good news. You may be found in Christ because of what he has done for you. But like me, you struggle to remember that it's good news. And you're still trying to earn something that's been freely given. I offer you the good news of the gospel. The treasure of the church is him and what he has done for you. Or you find yourself here this morning either not believing the things that we're talking about here today or struggling to believe them or you believe them, but you just feel like, I am stuck. I cannot come to God like this. I got to clean myself up first. I've got good news for you. Come as you are. It's not based on who you are. It's based on what Christ has done for you. Would you pray with me? Father, wherever we find ourselves this morning, we are in need of the good news. We are in need of what you have done alone. God, I pray that we would stop trying to earn what has been freely given to us and that we would receive your gift of grace and mercy this morning. God, I pray that those that don't believe the things that we're talking about here or struggle to believe them or God, just feel like they are not worthy to come to you. God, I pray that your spirit would move and do a work that only you could get the credit for, only you could get the glory for this morning. Bring people to yourself. Grant repentance this morning that people would turn from themselves and turn to the one that is good and glorious and worthy of praise. I pray that there would be uh, folks here this morning that would find themselves hidden in Christ for the first time here this morning. 
even if they don't understand all the ins and outs of it, that they would just lay their life down for you. Jesus, you tell us that when we lose our life for your sake, we will find true life. Pray that that would be someone's story here this morning. Father, thank you that we can worship you because you are a great God.